People are sharing the most chilling paranormal experience they ever had. Like and subscribe or I'll haunt you tonight. My cousin just passed away a couple weeks ago. I was very close to her and we play music on my speaker. Last week, I was chilling in the living room, out of nowhere, TV screen got turned on and went to Hulu under her profile name. No one had the remote, we've looking for the remote for days. Fast forward couple days later, I was laying on my bed out of nowhere, Google Home started playing some of her favorite songs three songs back to back. I'm freaking out. Never experienced stuff like this in my entire life. I think she's trying to send a message or trying to freak me out, since few days before she dies, we watched two paranormal activity movies and she always tried to scare me. To start with, my real parents died in a car accident and I got adopted from when I was around the age of 4. I've always seen this tall dark figure at the end of my bed or corner of the room in my dreams. It didn't have a hat or a brim, and it was always darker than the room it was in. It happens about three times a week or if I go anywhere new or overnight. Each house I've lived in, I've seen it. If I go to a friend's overnight, then it would be there too. I always thought it was just me being crazy and overthinking things. There was no way I could tell people and I didn't want to come off as that weirdo who sees things. While I was dating my husband, I saw it at his, and didn't say anything. We're now married and we have our 5 month old. Literally the other day I told him a weird dream I had of the black tall thing coming up the stairs, it opening the door and just staring at me and our baby. He turned white. He said he had the exact same dream that night, we shared the same dream. Upon talking, he admitted he had seen it for a while. He only saw it when he started dating me and obviously sees it often now in whatever house we are in. We have recently moved too, and he saw it the first night. In the hospital I gave birth in, because of the big C word, my husband had to go home on his own the very first night. I got moved to a ward and nurses would come check on myself and baby, come do my blood pressure and just take care of you until the morning. I was going home the next day. I saw whatever it was just standing outside the curtain rail of the hospital bed watching us. One nurse came to take my vitals and I heard her gasp and she shoved on the lights, blinding me in the process. She apologized quickly and said she's had a long night and apologized again for blinding me. She did a full look of the room before she left and made sure to leave the bedside table lamp on. The weird thing that happened was the first night of me being out of hospital and at home with our newborn baby, it was there in the corner. He said he saw it look at me, and then look down and into the crib and then just turn to leave. I'm now currently scared because it's validated that something is following me. I don't think it's evil, I think it's watching over me and now our baby. In 2012, we went to Pakistan on holiday and my cousin was one years old at the time. So my one year old cousin was sitting and playing under a tree in the backyard with others when he started acting weird. He wasn't acting normal and kept screaming and behaving weird. So at night, I was woken up by my aunt's mother-in-law as she wakes up at night and prays. My aunt, her mother-in-law and me saw my one-year-old cousin crawling away and saw him just crawling outside towards the tree he was playing under. My aunt started crying, but her mother-in-law said to her don't go after him. Then I realized why she said not to go after him. My one-year-old cousin was still asleep in the same room, and whatever that was crawling away and going back to the tree looking like my cousin was the thing that temporarily possessed him and was returning back to the tree. The next morning, he was completely normal and it never happened again. I saw that thing crawling away with my own eyes and wouldn't have known it wasn't my cousin. You can believe this story or not, but three people saw it happen including me. A few years ago, I was a CNA, certified nursing assistant. I worked at a nursing home and had a few encounters there, but nothing prepared me for everything that would happen when I stared working at a hospice home. It essentially is where people go to die. People that are sick and don't have a lot of time. The facility was amazing and worked quick on getting people in. The point is a lot, I mean a lot of people passed away in the building and a lot when I was working. I always opened the window in the residents room after someone passed away, my way of freeing the spirit, so they wouldn't be trapped. No one else unfortunately did this. On to the main point of this post. We have two wings of the building and each wing has a huge linen closet. Tons of sheets, 
blankets, comforters, towels, washcloths, gowns, etc. When you open the door, both walls are lined with racks filled with linen. You can walk down into the room a couple hundred feet and the turn to the right and it's a little area where extra stuff is stored, things for a bed baths and hygiene things for the residents. You are completely hidden when you are in area on the right. A resident woke up around midnight and wanted to get cleaned up, so I was going to give them a bed bath. I went into the linen closet and headed to the area on the right and was grabbing soap, toothbrush, toothpaste, a little basin, and other things. I heard the linen closet door open and close. We have one CNA and one RN on each wing during the night shift. I figured it was the nurse or the CNA for the other side, sometimes we grab each other if we need help. I then heard a female voice, hello? I'm just grabbing stuff for a bath, do you need help? I answered figuring it was the nurse. I'm so cold. I can bring you a blanket, maybe I'll throw it in the dryer again like last week. I laugh. I turn around and head to walk back down the main area of the linen closet and nobody is there. I didn't hear the door open again, so no one left and there is no place to hide. I then feel someone grab my shoulder, I scream and drop everything as I turn around so quickly and of course nobody is there. I ran out of there so fast. I tried to tell the nurse, but I wasn't making any sense until I calmed down. She stuck by my side the rest of the night, I didn't go back into the linen closet that night. When they had grabbed me felt like it touched my bare skin and it was so cold. This was one instant of so many encounters I experienced. Honestly I'm skeptical, or used to be about ghosts. When I was 16, I went on a trip to the UK and France, I was the only boy from my school who went, but there was another school with us, so I shared rooms with those dudes. Towards the end of the trip, the other school left, so it was just us for the last few days, and I had a room to myself. It was in Paris, I don't remember what hotel it was, but let me tell you it was huge, a few thousand rooms. I was laying in bed trying to go to sleep, and I had this loud ringing in my ears, then white light started to fill my vision, my eyes are closed and I am awake. Then I saw doctors above me, I was lying down on an operating table. Then everything returns dark and silent. Then there's a flash of even brighter white, and for the smallest fraction of a second, I saw a little girl's face. At this point, I open my eyes my heart is pounding. My eyes are wide open and I am awake, and I hear a little girl whisper, Hey, hey you, I'm under the bed, and it sounded like it came from under the bed to my right. I've never been so terrified in my life. Eventually, I fell asleep hiding under my blanket. In the morning, first thing I did was look under the bed, but the bed frame was completely enclosed, so there wasn't a space under the bed. This is the only real experience I've ever had, and I'll never forget it. In Sydney, there's this national park drive where people complete runs which consists of trying to complete the drives within a time stamp. I've been doing these so-called Nashu runs for a while now with my best friend every now and then, and nothing has happened before and the drive through the park is spooky at night, sure. But I've always found comfort in woodland or night drives, so I never thought of anything. A few nights ago, three of my friends and I went for a Nashu run and exactly at the halfway point, we hit a pothole pretty hard which resulted in a flat tire, and so we pulled over to the side on a long road. This place has no reception and it's in the middle of nowhere with no ways of walking through or back. We had a spare tire, but no change kit and so I had one friend on call for help which was a pain in the ass due to lack of reception. My best friend panics a lot, so she was on the verge of crying and I was rummaging through the boot for a wrench and a jack. About 20 meters away was a parked car, which was strange because the last house we passed was about a kilometer away and so we just shrugged it off. Later on in the dead of the night, we hear a group of friends laughing and this spooked my friends, so they stayed in the car. I told them I was going to follow the laughter and ask if they had a change kit in their parked car and Nate insisted on coming with me. We walked 20 meters to the parked car and no one was in there, and so it gets pretty dark, so I tell him to turn his flashlight onto which he does. We turn a corner on a gravel road and once we do, we see a woman standing there with her back face to us and the group laughter had stopped which left us in silence. She looked pretty normal to me, so I approached her slowly saying hey. And she didn't turn around or react, so I stopped in my tracks, but Nate continued walking towards her and he stopped about 5 meters away behind her. I yelled out, hey, and again, she didn't turn around. 
We weren't able to see her face, but something wasn't right. She was tall and all white, but I looked at Nate and he just stood there and under his breath. He muttered my name and told me to go repeatedly, so I turned around and started walking and by the time we passed the car, we started running back to our car. We sat inside and I asked what happened and he said that something was wrong, because a woman shouldn't be standing there by herself in pitch darkness in the middle of a gravel road. And in addition to that, she didn't turn around to the sound of us, or our source of light. We told our two other friends and Nate was very shaken up, they sort of laughed it off and when we ended up changing the tire, we turned the car back around and stopped right at where we saw the woman. I rolled the window down and shined my flash the gravel road was blocked, and the woman was gone, no more laughter, just silence. I thought maybe I had imagined her, but we stood right there and Nate was right behind her. However, every single one of us heard the group laughter and there is a fair share of paranormal stories about this national park drive due to the amount of deaths, but I never paid attention to it. It doesn't sound like much, just a girl standing there, but something about it seems so off. The laughter got relatively loud the closer we got, but came to a halt once we saw her. Nate swears he saw a white dress, but I could swear she was wearing white pants and a top. Nothing seems to be adding up. In September, my partner and I signed the lease on a dream apartment. I was ridiculously excited and kept telling everyone I knew all about it, to the point where I was probably actually pretty annoying. One day, a friend of mine came to visit me at work and of course I told her the news of our new place. She asked me where it was, and when I told her the location, she turned pale and seemed uncomfortable at best, and flat out scared at worst. She asked to see a picture of the inside, and when I showed her, she let out a long sigh of relief, then proceeded to tell me one of the creepiest stories I have ever heard. It turns out that about five years ago, she had lived in the house directly next to mine with her sister and boyfriend. Starting almost immediately when they moved in, they began hearing noises out in the kitchen area at night when they were sleeping, and occasionally woke up to open cabinets or kitchen tools scattered around. Eventually, they started hearing what sounded like kids talking in low voices in the kitchen at night, occasional crying, and crashes that sounded far off but still somewhere in the house. Around this time, my friend and her sister started to fight a lot and said they had both been feeling extremely irritable about everything. Their house was broken into while they were all at work one night, but nothing was stolen except some cheap costume jewelry. There was cash, valuable jewelry and designer clothing in the house, but it was all left untouched. Later in the same month, they received a visit from the cops, who said a neighbor had called about screaming and crying coming from the house, and had reported that they left their kids there alone when they went out. They didn't have kids. The cops were called a few other times and finally got a search warrant, and somehow ended up finding a trapdoor under the kitchen window area that was covered in a layer of leaves and dirt. They found out that it was the remnants of a very very old root cellar. I live in one of the oldest cities in America by European colonizer standards and much of the structures are built on top of older structures. Apparently one thing led to another in the search down there and the police recovered some very very old skeletal remains of two children. Nobody seemed to know if the skeletons or the root cellar were there first. During all of this, my friend and her sister broke their lease and moved out of there as soon as possible, as they were terrified to be there any longer. I went through with my lease and live in the building next door to where all this happened. My apartment is an old adobe market that was converted into an apartment in the 70s, and it's been an absolute dream to live here, no scary vibes or noises at all. The couple who live in that house now seem pretty nice and keep to themselves, we all have high adobe privacy walls and coyote fences, and I feel tempted to see if they know about all of this, but I'm afraid it might make them uncomfortable if I approach them about it. My grandma lives in a very stereotypical horror movie house, small midwest town, white and old looking home, on a farm. She even has a chipped wooden Mary nativity in the front yard. She also has a cemetery about a half mile down the road. I used to sleep in the room in the corner on the top floor, my aunt's room, and it had a wooden rocking chair in it. When I was younger, I would wake up because I thought I heard it rocking, to the point where I would wake up my grandma and have to stay in her room. About 10 years later my mom, aunt and I were talking about how creepy my grandma's house was. My aunt goes on to talk about how when she was younger the reason my mom and her ended up sharing a room was because she thought her room was haunted. She said she woke up one morning and the rocking chair was about two feet closer to her bed, and after that night, 
It would start rocking on a nightly basis at midnight. Until a few years ago, I still had a flip phone phone. One day, I got a random call asking for some girl named Sarah. I told them they had the wrong number and they hung up. For the next few months, I would get these calls asking for Sarah about once or twice a week, coming from different number and different sounding people. Sometimes these calls came at 3 in the morning. One day, I got a call and like usual, I said I didn't know Sarah. After they hung up, I went to my contacts and hit redial. The answering machine said that number did not exist. I went back through my call history trying to call some other people that had called me with the same result, a machine telling me the number did not exist. Every time I would get these calls, I would redial the number and still got the machine. I googled the numbers, but all I learned was that were coming from North Dakota, Montana, basically everywhere in the Midwest. The next time I got a call asking for Sarah, I said, oh yeah, she is right here, and the other person on the other end said, no she isn't, and hung up. Things started getting weird when I started getting calls from unknown numbers calling me. Whoever or whatever on the other end hung up the second I said hello. Once I got a call where they didn't hang up after I said hello, and I could hear someone was on the other end just listening, but they didn't say anything, just something really uneasy about it. I was staying in the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas, oldest property on the strip with assorted mob history. In the middle of the night, I woke and saw a dark figure moving around the foot of my bed and coming up the gap between the twin beds. I hit the light, and there was a full figure of a man in a 60s sports blazer with blood all over his face. I yelled go away, and start flinging my arm in his direction. Just like that, he disappeared. I woke my friends in the other bed and my buddy said, what the hell you swatting at? I told them and they laughed at me. The following morning, my buddy said after I had fallen asleep, water was dripping on his head, but there was no leak on the ceiling and was convinced we may have shared a paranormal encounter. I had a black cat called Casper. We adopted her after she ran away from the previous owner. She was missing for days before the previous owner found her in the bushes, skittish and frightened. After carrying her home, the owner discovered she was allergic to cats when her arm broke out with rashes. She put out a call for a new home, which was answered by my animal-loving family. For ages, she was scared to come near anyone and was totally averse to being petted. Eventually, she turned into a total ham, never missing the chance to jump on you and lie with you. We loved her, and I loved her heaps. Then one day, she lost the use of her back legs. Not long after, she passed away. I was having a rough time then, and she was a big comforter. Point is, my parents and I were sad. A few days after, I'm sitting on my front step having a smoke, and I gear a meowing sound identical to Casper. I look out front and there, at the gate, was a cat meowing at me, that looked just like Casper. I went over, and it ran away. I looked down the street after it, and it was gone. I mentioned it to my parents. They both said the same thing happened to each of them separately, which was a surprise to them too. Now it could have been a similar cat from the neighborhood, but it only happened once to each of us then was never seen again. When I was 16, I was riding horses with my friend in the field beside her house. The horse threw me and I hit my head, hard. The next thing I know, I'm on my back in incredible pain staring up at my friend, who is frantically screaming at me. Dazed, my gaze shifted and then refocused on her friend behind her, a tall thin man wearing a black suit and an old-fashioned, wide-brimmed hat. He was staring unblinking into my eyes over my friend's shoulder. Days later, she came to visit me in the hospital, and I asked her about the man I'd seen. I thought it was the new boyfriend she'd recently told me about. She told me there was no one there but me and her. Back in 2005, I was in a band that toured the country in a 15-passenger van with a trailer. We were on the way from Columbus, Ohio to Erie, Pennsylvania. The show had been cancelled in Ohio due to a power outage, so we decided to get on the road early as we had friends in Erie who were taking us in for the night. I'll never forget this moment for the rest of my life. We were all having a conversation, there were eight of us total in the van when the driver and passenger both shouted simultaneously, what the was that? I'm getting goosebumps on my arms right now just remembering the event. I was sitting being the driver with my back against the window, 
and I didn't see anything but we heard a whooshing noise as if something flew right over the van. My friend who was sitting next to me looked like he had just seen a ghost. We wound up pulling over on the side of the road because everyone was freaking out, thinking we hit something. Nothing was found. Both the passenger and driver said they saw a tall black figure lunge at the van from the shoulder of the left lane, my friend who was sitting next to me said the same thing. The next day, we inspected the van in daylight and noticed there were streak marks across the roof of the van. When I was seven, I suddenly awoke in the middle of the night to a young child kneeling near my bed praying. At first, I thought it was my younger brother, so I asked him what he was doing. After I asked, he slowly looked at me and stood up and started running, so I hopped out of bed and followed him down my stairs and out my front door. We had a long driveway, and I followed him all the way to the end and then he simply vanished. I went back to my room and nothing like that has happened since. When I was about 14, I was staying up way too late on the computer. It was about 2 in the morning, and everyone else was asleep. I got thirsty, and wandered down the hallway to get a drink. I didn't bother to turn on any lights since there was a nightlight in the hallway, and there was enough light to get by. I'm walking back to the bedroom when I get this weird feeling like someone is watching me, and turn around. There is this big white mist just floating right behind me. I immediately turned around and went back into the safe bright room. The thing is, there were no windows facing that hallway, and I hadn't passed the nightlight yet, so it definitely wasn't a trick of the light. All the doors leading to the hallway were also closed. A few years later when I was moved to the small room closest to that spot, I got the heebie-jeebies and couldn't sleep without a lamp on. It wasn't until some time later after the sighting that I learned that in the 80s, a guy was renting out the house. He was arrested for the kidnap, rape, and disappearance of a bunch of kids in the area, and for the suspected murder of his wife. They never found her, and she supposedly ran away, according to him. Cadaver dogs went over the farm, but they never found anything. The cops must not have done a good job though because when they moved in, my mom found a pair of boys' underwear in the toilet tank. The missing wife was never found, and he died in prison about a decade ago. I think she's still there though. When my boyfriend was about four years old, he would talk to a man he saw in the mirror. Naturally, his parents were curious about his behavior, and asked him questions about the man. He told his parents details about the man including his appearance, hobbies, and how he died. It turns out that one of the former owners of the house was a man who had committed suicide in the house, and he matched the descriptions of the man my boyfriend saw in the mirror. When his parents found out, they moved out of the house a month later. Back in 2007, my grandpa finally lost his 20-year battle with leukemia. My grandma couldn't manage well, being alone in the house they'd lived in for almost 60 years. We moved my grandma into an assisted living residence a few months later, and for insurance reasons, my parents asked me if I'd like to move into the house so that I could watch the house, and also to move out and not live at home. I said absolutely. I remember right after he passed away, strange things started happening. The portrait we had of him in the living room fell off its hook. Picture frames containing pictures of him flipped onto their front during the night. I didn't mind though because I thought my grandma was making it up. Before I moved in, my family got a big dumpster, so we could clean some of the clutter out of the house. Since we'd spend most of the day cleaning and it was summer, we'd bring the family dog with us. My grandpa loved our dog dearly. But since he passed, my dog wouldn't go down to the basement anymore, where my grandpa spent most of his time in his office. She refused to go into the basement at all, and barked at the stairway a few times. This was weird, since our dog almost never barked. It finally made me think he's here. I moved in shortly after. While I lived there, things went missing all the time. I had bought a new lock set to change the back door lock, brought it home and put it in the cupboard to tackle on the weekend. Few days later, I go to change the lock, and it's gone. After a week of looking around, I finally found it in the trunk of my uncle's old BMW 2002 which he stored in the garage, I happened to be looking at the car. My grandpa was always a prankster, so I almost came to expect these occurrences. He used to wake up at 5.30 every morning to listen to the early news on the radio in the kitchen. I'd wake up some mornings and the radio would be on. I often heard typewriter noises coming from his office in the basement. 
It became comforting. I found myself talking to my grandpa out loud, having conversations with him, I missed him. After about six months, suddenly I wasn't hearing any noises anymore, nothing was going missing, the radio wasn't turning on at 5.30. I shrugged it off for a few days, but it started to worry me. I went back to my parents and grabbed the dog, brought her back. She was apprehensive at first, but she entered the house. There was an issue though. Every time she'd been over since my grandpa died, as I mentioned earlier, she refused to go downstairs. This time though, she went downstairs, and went right to his office. Nothing was any different about the office, but she wasn't barking. She wasn't pacing, she wasn't doing anything. That was when I realized he was gone. I broke down. Suddenly, I felt incredibly alone, even though it had been about 8 months since he died, it was the first time I felt like he was gone. I'll be the first to say that all this stuff could have taken place in my head. The mind is a freaky thing and can play some pretty trippy tricks on you. Whenever I was scared as a kid, my dad had always told me that in life, you should not be scared of ghosts, fear the living because they can actually hurt you. In my late teenage years, I came into some money after my father committed suicide and I received an inheritance from him. At time of my dad's passing, he and my mom owned a cabin up in Oregon by Mount Bachelor. The cabin had been put up for sale since my mom could no longer afford the payments and renting it out was not covering the payments either. The cabin was set to go on the market for sale in less than a month and was in the process of finalizing all the paperwork with the realtor and lawyer. So for that month's time the cabin was not going to be rented out any longer and was going to be vacant. I saw this as a chance to get away for a while and clear my head in light of all the things going on. I quit work, packed up my snowboarding gear grabbed my dog and headed up in my dad's car, that he had willed to me, to the cabin. Now this was our family cabin that my parents rented out throughout the year when we were not using it. I had keys to the cabin and also had the code for the alarms, so I did not feel the need to stop at the rental management company and advise them of my stay. This has nothing to do with the coming story, but felt the need to mention it anyway. My first two days at the cabin were normal and nothing out of the unusual happened. Spent my days playing with my dog in the snow, snowboarding in the evenings playing PlayStation or listening to music, drinking and smoking out on the balcony. Had already stocked up on food, cigarettes and liquor, so I was pretty much a shut and aside from the occasional out to hit the slopes. With my dog as company and DVDs and PlayStation as entertainment, I was quite content and started to feel relaxed after all the drama that had preceded my outing. The cabin itself was two stories bottom story had the living room and a side guest bedroom along with small kitchen. Upstairs had another two rooms along with a walkout balcony attached to the master bedroom. Most my time there was spent either in the living room, kitchen or master bedroom. I never ventured into the other rooms and always kept the doors leading into them shut, open doors to dark rooms always creeped me out. Anyhow, the third day came around and I was going through my usual routine of playing with my dog, his name was Midnight by the way and he also since passed, playing games and watching DVDs. That day it was pretty heavy snowfall, so I did not feel like trekking down the hill to the main road in my car and decided to stay in. That's when things started getting a bit weird. In our area there were only two other cabins adjacent to ours, maybe a block away from each other. All other cabins aside from these two were around a mile away from ours. Surrounding us was mostly forest and very tall pine trees, tall, this is important later on. Both these cabins were empty and from the past couple of days I knew that no one was currently staying there. Gave enough background and I'm going to jump to the weirdness. Around midday while outside with my dog, I noticed what looked like footprints in the snow around the area surrounding our cabin. It was still snowing so the footprints looked semi-fresh like someone had been there in the last 20 to 30 minutes before me. I thought that maybe someone was staying in the cabin near me that I may not have noticed, maybe they were shut-ins like me. Alright, whatever, the prints lead away from my cabin and they disappeared in the snow towards the denser part of the trees, disregarded the footprints and went back inside. Nighttime came around and decided to head to bed. My dog Midnight was laying on the bed with me when I noticed his ears perk up to a standstill or listening position. This was followed by him quickly jumping off the bed and running downstairs to the living room. I lay in bed and stayed silent, I was kinda freaked out, and could hear him moving around downstairs back and forth. After around 5 minutes, 
He ran back upstairs to me and started to do his doggy dance for the sign that he had to pee or that he wanted to go outside. Dang, well fine. I can't say no to him so we both went downstairs to the outside driveway for him to his thing. Only, he didn't want to pee. As soon as we were outside, he started to pull on his leash trying to drag me to where he wanted to go. He kept looking into the dense part of the trees where the prince had been earlier. But he also kept sniffing the side of the house and looking up towards the roof. After he figured out that I was not going to go to where he wanted, he sat himself down and just stared into the darkness. A bit unusual for him but alright, maybe there are forest animals out there that he wants to chase down. But f this, did not want to chance anything, so I pulled him back inside and we both headed back upstairs. Around half an hour later, I was lying in bed when I heard what sounded like hooves walking on my roof. It was only a series of around six steps and I rationalized that it could be a pine cone falling from a tree onto the roof or maybe a kind-hearted forest animal running around. But here's the thing, the steps seemed to be spaced apart like a man-length stride. So it was really freaking me out. Midnight also heard the noise and was quick to run to the balcony screen door expecting for me to let him out. Alright, you know what, I'm a tough guy and at the time considered myself to be fairly well built and strong enough to handle myself. So I grabbed my coat and shoes along with my cigarettes and flashlight and went out onto the balcony. F it right? As soon as I was outside, I lit up my cigarette and started canvassing the roof with my light, nothing there and the snow on top was undisturbed. Weird, must have been all my head. What about midnight hearing the noise? Maybe he was feeding off my fear or paranoia. I started to calm down and relax again. By the way, I am shaking right now and my heart is beating hard as I am typing this next bit. My eyes started to adjust to the darkness and I kept smoking and just staring at the stars and trees next to our cabin. That's when I saw it. In a tree, that was a little taller than our cabin and around 20 feet from the balcony, I saw what looked like a man crouched in a squatting position in between two branches. It was squatted on one branch and its arms were extended above its head holding onto the branch above it. F me, what the heck is that? I wasn't sure if I was really seeing this thing and stood just staring and sat there motionless. I noticed Midnight stand up and start pacing behind me and lightly barking at the same time. The thing still did not move. I put my cigarette out and was debating on shining the light in the thing's direction, but something in my head kept screaming not to. So I walked backwards to the inside of the room and pulled Midnight with me. Once inside, I locked the door and shined the light in the thing's direction, but there was nothing there. I shut the curtains to the screen door and retreated back to bed. But later on in the night, I heard light tapping at the screen door, like someone was tapping on the glass with their fingers. It was consistent and did not stop for nearly an hour. Midnight seemed to stare at the door, but he wouldn't go near it anymore. The weirdest part was that I had a feeling like someone was inviting me to open the door. But at the same time, I kept hearing my dad's voice in my head telling me to stay in bed and not do it. I listened to my dad's voice and just stayed where I was. Passed out eventually and woke up in the morning and everything was normal. The rest of week, I spent there was non-eventful and nothing else out of the ordinary happened. I totally admit that it could have been all in my head. A lot of stuff was going on at the time, so I was pretty messed up from all the drama. I was living in an apartment with three roommates at the time. I was working all sorts of weird hours, and would stay up late most nights. Our apartment had two hallways that formed in capital L. My room is at the top of the L. The bathroom was in the corner of where the lines meet. With the door being in the inside middle of the small section. In the outside corner was the living room. I walked out of my room to go to the bathroom, no need to turn the light on as this was a trek I had made hundreds of times before. As I left the bathroom, I turned to go back to my room. Just as I turned off the lights of the bathroom there standing where the short hallway and the living room met, there was a teenage girl standing there. Wearing a white flowery dress, just smiling. She didn't look evil, just a normal person standing there smiling at me. I freaked the hell out and went running for my room. About 20 minutes later, I finally came out of my room. Turning all the lights on as I went through the apartment. She was nowhere to be seen, however where I saw her standing was noticeably colder than the rest of the apartment should have been for an August evening. Creepy, but not the worst part. I lived there for about another year, and I never saw her again. After I had moved out, 
I was hanging out with my one roommate who had the bedroom at the end of the small hallway, right next to the bathroom. We were talking and I told him that I never felt comfortable in the apartment after something happened. To which he responded oh, you saw her too? I nearly drove off the road when I heard this. We then both described her, finishing off each other's sentences describing her. He had seen her twice. I was indifferent about ghosts before that. Now I believe in them, or believe in something. It was very creepy and every time I tell the story, the hairs stand up on my arms. I was living in a house in Laguna Beach that had been there since the 1920s. In its history, it had been a speakeasy, a brothel and a house for smuggling illegal immigrants. One day, my new wife and I were having an argument. I can't even recall what it was about. She walked down the block to get a cup of coffee and cool off, and I was alone in the house. The way the place was built was incredibly haphazard. There was a bedroom and living room on one side, then a bathroom with two entrances. On the other side of the bathroom was a hallway that had windows in one side and two bedrooms on the other. From my bedroom, I could look across the hall into the bathroom, then through the bathroom and down the other hall. I was standing at my dresser, and I just noticed movement out the corner of my eye, and looked down there. There was, and honest to God, this gives me goosebumps just typing it, 17 years later, a black figure. It was maybe 3 feet tall, and it was only vaguely humanoid. It looked like black scribbles, like someone had scribbled a human shape, but the scribbles moved, like electricity arcing, that's the best way to describe it. There was no sound that I could remember. I distinctly remember when I saw it I wasn't afraid, just like, what the heck? Then it noticed me looking at it. I can't say it turned around, it just focused on me I guess. Then I was scared, I didn't move, didn't scream, nothing, I was just frozen, because it just came at me, it rushed down the hall towards me. I have no idea what it intended, but as soon as it entered the bathroom, the door closest to me just slammed shut on it. The I screamed, I yelled for my wife, she wasn't home. I went outside, into the daylight, and didn't go back in until she got home about 10 minutes later. I don't believe in ghosts, I don't believe I saw something supernatural, but I know I saw something. I don't know what it was. I grew up in the Arctic. In the town I lived in, as long as it was a clear night, it was an extremely normal occurrence to see all sorts of strange lights move across the sky. Keep in mind, the winter is long in the Arctic, which means longer amounts of time being spent under the stars. It's quite beautiful, as long as you don't mind the cold so much. Sometimes, I would drive a snowmobile a few kilometers out of town, shut it down, and just lay down on the snow looking up at the majesty of it all, the only thing disturbing the silence being the occasional breeze. The northern lights are also a common occurrence. Doesn't happen every day, but often enough that they start getting ignored after a while, as long as they aren't too spectacular anyway. On one particular night, without asking my parents, it was their snowmobile, I decided to go on one of my midnight drives out of town. I drove a few kilometers over the hills to find a spot devoid of light pollution from town, shut off the machine, and settled into a good spot to look up and be retrospective. It wasn't all that interesting a scene. A few satellites passing here and there, some relatively boring activity affecting the magnetic field, etc. And then I started noticing a clicking noise. At first, I thought it was the sound of the snow machine cooling down, as engine expands and contracts a lot in the cold. But the source of the sound definitely wasn't coming from that direction. My next thought was there must be an animal nearby in which case I need to get out of there fast, you don't really want to mess with a wild animal. But, the clicking is far too regular for an animal to produce it. It was fairly mechanical sounding. And again, the source of the sound isn't coming from anywhere around me laterally. It was coming from up. So naturally, I look up determined to ascertain the origin of this strange noise. I see what I always see, stars, northern lights, a lazy satellite crossing the sky, all normal stuff. But before I dismiss it altogether and begin heading home, I notice something strange in the Aurora Borealis. There were three rather strong points of light. I ignored them at first thinking they were oddly symmetrical stars, but this proved false. They were definitely getting brighter. I kept staring in morbid fascination as they grew stronger and stronger, yet still only remaining single points in the sky. All the while the clicking noise is getting louder and louder and more pronounced, 
Almost like someone started with tapping a pen on a desk to clacking billiard balls together inside my head. Then it stops. The lights are gone, the clicking is not heard, and aside from being a little stiff, cold, and rather petrified, I'm fine. So I jump back on the snowmobile thinking maybe I'm going crazy. The machine takes a little longer than usual to start up, and I'm beginning to worry, but soon it's running and I'm heading back to town. As I'm driving back several plausible scenarios as to what occurred are running through my head. I'm thinking it could have been a helicopter from the mine, or some strange northern lights behavior etc, probably not that big a deal. I pull up to my house, lights are all dark, strange. It wasn't that late when I left. Open outer door as quietly as possible, remove winter gear, enter inner door. House is quiet, really quiet. My parents are teachers and are usually up late marking or watching TV, all I'm thinking is I have to get to bed without anyone noticing. Proves to be easy as I'm soon under my covers. I go to set my alarm for the next day. All of the sudden, everything makes sense. Engine hard to start, stiff, rather chilly, nobody up when I was gone what felt like relatively short period of time. It was almost 11 pm when I left, and now it was creeping up on 6 am. I stood staring at clicking lights for almost seven hours. I never ended up sleeping that night, and I don't go on late night snow machine rides anymore. When my mom was a young girl growing up in Vietnam, she had this weird dream about being in a darkened church. Everyone was talking in hushed tones, but it was English, so she didn't understand what was going on. But she remembered certain details, like the stained glass windows and the baptismal font. She told her parents, but they were kinda dismissive. They just told her it was a weird dream. A few years later, she was forced to flee South Vietnam because of the Vietnam War. Her family relocated to Florida, and they started their life over. About 10 years later, she went to the local Catholic church for her younger sister's confirmation. And suddenly, she realized it was the same church she had dreamed of as a child. The same darkened church, the same stained glass, the same baptismal font. She talked to her parents again and they remembered her having the dream and describing the place exactly. Maybe some of it is altered memory, but it's one of our family legends. It was in my first year at university, completely new to the city and its surroundings. One evening, my friend and I decided to take a trip to the mall. It was 8 pm and we got on a bus that my friend claimed would take us to the mall. We ended up at an empty bus terminal and it was around 10 at that time. We waited and waited for another bus back and there was no one there but us. A while later, an old man walked by and told us that since it's so late, another bus won't be coming for an hour or so. He told us to turn and walk down the road and we'll find a bus stop in the middle where a bus will soon come. We followed his instructions and entered this single lane road with tall trees on each side. There were only a few street lamps working, so the area was dimly lit. The road was sort of built on a slant. Our bus stop was in middle, so we could see all the way up the road and down the road, and it was a single lane road. All we could see was the road and trees on either side for at least half a kilometer on each side. Anyways, so we're waiting and waiting. My phone battery died and my friend had forgotten hers in her dorm room. We were starting to think there won't be any bus coming and started to panic. Then, as we were waiting, I turned around to see two kids with backpacks walking down the road. I was relieved to see them and so was my friend. When they were close by, I asked them if they knew about any buses coming. There were two kids, maybe around 12 to 13, one was a boy and other was a girl, both had backpacks. Here is our conversation, not exact, but close. Me, hey, do you know if there are any buses coming? Boy, let me check takes phone out, walks towards the bus stop sign, but it's empty and doesn't say the timing nor the stop number. Just a picture of a bus, I knew this from before. Me, the timings aren't there and there's no number to text either, I've looked at it before. Boy, still looking at phone, oh it's okay, your bus will be here in 10 minutes I think. Meanwhile, during this conversation, my friend started talking to the girl. Girl, where are you guys from? Friend, we just started university here, what about you? Girl, oh, we're in school and we're just going back home from school. Friend, oh okay. After the boy told me that the bus would be here in 10 minutes, I turned my head to tell my friend this, 
turned my head back to thank the boy and he was gone. Gone, the girl and the boy were nowhere to be seen. I literally probably looked away for a second max. We both looked down the road, up the road, and by the trees. They had a fence around them, but even if they went there, we would have seen them. I literally looked away for a second. Needless to say, both of us were scared as hell until our bus arrived. It was the last bus and it was around 12.17 am when the bus came. I know because we asked the time from the bus driver. I asked my brother about the area later, I didn't tell him what happened. He said that there's a graveyard there. And then it hit me that what the hell would two 13 year olds be doing in the middle of nowhere coming back from school at midnight. I didn't believe in paranormal activities, but I can't seem to find an explanation for this one. Me and some buddies were bored one night and decided to head out and poke around an abandoned mental hospital. The only way in was through the autopsy room, the rest of the place was pretty much sealed off. So we go in, me another guy and two girls. As soon as we get into the autopsy room, one of the girls starts hyperventilating and crying. She said she just couldn't be there anymore. We tried everything we could to convince her everything was going to be fine, to no avail. She wanted to leave, and wanted to leave now. Disappointed, we decided we had to leave. The two girls were walking in front of us, one trying to comfort the other, while me and the other dude walked a bit of a way behind. I don't know what brought me to look back, morbid curiosity maybe, but I did. Now, I'll admit it was dark, but the moon was out so it wasn't pitch black. Still, I know what I seen. A window on the second floor, what looked just like a little girl in a white dress staring back at us. I looked for a good 10 seconds, stopped my buddy and had him look without taking my eyes at the thing, and asked him specifically, do you see that? I thought I may have been seeing things, or maybe it was a trick of the light. But no, we both saw it and stared for a good 20 seconds after. I might have thought it was some kind of trick, but after 20 seconds or so, it moved. We noped the hell out of there, passing the girls and screaming at them to get in the car. Is it possible it could have been some other people there, who happened to bring a girl who might have looked from a distance to be a lot younger than she was? Yes. There were no other cars around though, so whoever it was would have had to walk a pretty good distance to get there. It could have also been a homeless family that was using the place for warmth, who knows. All I know is what I saw, it was a little girl, in a white dress, staring at us. From the second story window of an abandoned mental joint, at 2 in the goddamn morning. I was working late shifts, so I would be back home around 3 am and would usually stay up an hour watching TV before I fell asleep. We live in a apartment complex with small buildings, each building has about 6 apartments, and we lock the main entrance to the building at night. It's a metal grill gate that allows you to see who's on the other side. It's a close-knit community, where we all keep a track of each other and usually the person who comes in last locks it. On most nights I work the late shift, that would be me. But also because I stayed up till 4 am or so, and also because we lived on the ground floor. If anyone happened to come later, they would just call out to me from the window to open the door, instead of bothering their own family or roommates who might be asleep at that hour. I didn't mind it as people only called out my name if they saw the lights in my living room turned on and wouldn't trouble me if I had already gone to bed. So this one time, I was watching late night documentary or cartoons or something that had my undivided attention, and I heard my name being called. It was familiar female voice requesting me to open the gate. But I was so engrossed in my TV show, I didn't think about who it was, and very absent-mindedly got up while still keeping my eye on the TV, rummaged through the top of the shelf for the keys to main entrance of the building, opened my apartment door and quickly rushed to open the main gate, so I wouldn't miss any of the show I was watching. And just before I could unlock the gate fully, it caught my attention there was no one on the other side. I could see all the way to the gates of the next building, and not a single person in sight. Needless to say, I was terrified rushed back home, locked my apartment door, switched off the TV and tried to recall whose voice I had heard call my name or if I had imagined it. But the more I think about it, I am certain that I heard the old lady who lived upstairs call me to open the door. But that didn't make sense, cause she had no reason to be out by herself that late at night. I asked her anyway when I bumped into her later that week if she had been stuck outside late night at any point, and she was taken aback, cause it was a weird question, and then joked that maybe the forest spirits were visiting our building and wanted to be let in. 
So I work in a large bunker complex from World War II and stayed for a night shift the other day. I'm an editor, so I had headphones on most of the time. Every now and then though, I thought I heard some music from somewhere, but brushed it off as just me being tired. At around 1 AM, I went for a smoke in an area that basically only me and my bosses can access. It's an old stairwell used to transport heavy cargo that doesn't fit in any elevator. As I approached the door, I once again heard music, but this time clear as day. As I opened the door it got really really loud, like as if someone was sitting with a violin at the bottom of the stairwell. I work in the fourth floor, no other floor has direct access to the stairwell except the very bottom. Needless to say, I was weirded out but thought, ha, huh, maybe some composer uses their free time and practices here. Yeah, I know kinda stupid assumption, but the only explanation I had in the moment. The semi-social person I am, I went down to see who was playing and say hello, since the music was actually kind of beautiful. It reminded me a bit of the classical Bioshock music and was, as far as I can tell, played by one single person on one violin. However, after I stepped down like four or five steps, the music abruptly stopped. Not in the way that you stop a recording, I could actually hear clattering and foley sounds from handling a string instrument. I went down all the way and looked for any open doors or some way for this person to have gotten in here. However, there was nothing and no one in sight that would suggest someone just played the music there. So, kinda disappointed, I went all the way back up. Bunker's floors are about double the normal height, so I had to walk up around six floors. But just as I stepped back into our hallway, the music started again, so I went down again. Surely enough, there was no one there. At that point, my confusion turned into being kinda creeped out. I double-checked if every door was locked, which they were, and if the elevator, which had been out of service for a while worked again, maybe that's how they got there. But no, it was still stuck below ground floor as it had for almost a year. So I thought, okay, every door is locked and the only way in here is to have a key through one of the doors on each floor, five floors in total. So I went back up and waited, since I was sure to hear someone unlock a door and step into the stairwell. Nope, I reached the top, and at eerily that precise moment, I heard weird violin sounds first, like someone mildly plucking the strings, then the music set in again. And it was loud, like really loud. So I went down again, only to find nothing again. At that point, I was actually wondering if I was just too exhausted and starting to hallucinate or something. That's how I explained the music to me for the rest of the night. It was only the next morning that my stupid brain realized that I recorded the music the first time I heard it loudly, so there's no chance of this being just in my head. During a school break, me and my mom and one of my older brothers went to go visit our uncle on his ranch in Nevada. I have trouble sleeping, so one night, I decided to take a walk around the perimeter of the ranch, just for some air. I had made it all the way to the other side of the ranch, to the far end of the pastures. From the last fence to a woodsy hill area is about 50 yards. I decided to stay and look up in the grassy area to look at the stars. What no one had told this city girl was that with no trees and no lights, save for the barn on the other side of the ranch, you can see so many stars. It was breathtaking to see the universe like that. I started whistling. I heard a branch crack, so I stopped, a little startled. Then something else started to whistle right at me. I froze and it seemed like every hair on my body stood straight up. I couldn't move and the whistling got louder, and closer. It was the almost exact same nonsense melody I was whistling not 15 seconds ago. I know what you're thinking, but, birds are a thing. No, I know the difference between a bird and whatever the hell that was. And this ain't even over yet, so buckle up. I, the stupid white girl in a horror movie, decided to say, uh, hello? Something said a hello right back to me in my own voice. And yes, I know what my voice sounds like. Slightly raspy, faint Bronx accent, usually lower pitched unless I'm excited or mad. Then it's usually so high pitched my friends say I sound like Harley Quinn on Adderall. Another branch snapped and that was my cue to book it back down around the paddocks back to the barn and main house, which was about two acres. It was like a blur. I have knee issues from a car crash but I didn't feel even an ache as I sprinted all the way back to the main house. I still don't know what it was, didn't tell anyone else about it, despite my mom being extremely superstitious. 
I did a little bit of frantic googling the day after, and the closest thing I could come up with was a skinwalker. My story starts December 25, 2020. All day as I celebrated Christmas with my wife and our two kids I felt off as if something was wrong. At one point while letting our dog outside, I heard someone say my name outside, and when I turned around, I was the only person out there. But this has not been uncommon for me throughout my life, it just happened multiple times this day which was not normal. As the day progressed, I felt more worn down, I carried a few things down to our basement from Christmas and I was whipped. The kids woke us up around 5 am like most 11 and 8 year olds do on Christmas morning, so we were all tired and ready for bed just after 8 pm. We all went to bed as we did every night brushing our teeth saying prayers and then saying our good night. This is where things take a turn for the worse. At around 3 am, I sat straight up out of bed, looked at my wife and asked her why she shook me, and what was wrong. She claimed that she was sleeping and never touched me. I had a severe pain between my shoulders, I was shaking, uncontrollably, and overall very anxious. My wife and I agreed that due to it being early Saturday morning that I could either wait until later in the day to go to the urgent care or because my back hurt so bad, I could go to the ER to get checked out. For other reasons that I will get back to, I decided to go to the hospital. Oddly enough, all the way to the hospital, I never got a red light or never saw another vehicle on the road. I arrived to the hospital and they immediately started checking me out, as I was the only person in the waiting room. My pulse and heart rate were slightly elevated but not alarming, due to my symptoms the doctor said even though I was only 38, he was going to run some tests, including an EKG just to make sure that things were okay. The nurse came on put the leads on me and said, sir, you are having an active heart attack. She pressed a button on the wall, and before you knew there was a dozen people in my room with me, from ripping my clothes off me to get me into a gown to placing emergency adhesive paddles on my chest just in case they had to shock me. I do remember someone standing over me and saying, don't worry you are going to be okay, I'm here with you. Not to bore you with the next week's days of basically sitting in a hospital bed, I will tell you that I ended up having one stint placed in the lower left side of my heart. I had blockage in one artery, my cardiologist said that I was lucky that most people in my situation would have taken Tylenol or aspirin or something gone back to bed and never woke up. He told me that I survived a widowmaker. Fast forward to 8 weeks later, I returned to work. I work in home care and I see patients in their homes, I had a doctor's order to go see a patient and when I arrived, his wife answered the door. When she greeted me and opened the door, she said, you've recently been through a traumatic experience, she said that she was a grievance counselor and she could feel the energy around me. She told me that my grandmother was with me the whole time and was watching over me, she died in the 80s. Keep in mind this is the first time that I had met this woman, she continued to say that my grandma didn't want my family to experience the same grief that her and my mom felt, my grandfather died of a heart attack at age 39. As my eyes swelled and tears ran down my cheeks, I realized who shook me in my bed and woke me, whose voice it was, who told me to get up that something was wrong, and who was standing over me in the emergency department telling me that I would be okay, I was overcome with emotion. I don't know why I deserve this second chance, but it was given to me and I am doing my best to make the best of it. There's obviously more details, but that will be for another day. Disclaimer, I know that this isn't your traditional paranormal story, but for some reason, I felt like I needed to share it here, perhaps someone else needed to hear it. Not all spirits are bad, sometimes we need to remember that. About five years ago, I was in the Air Cadets, a UK organization affiliated with the RAF. My squadron was and is based in the sergeant's mess at IWM Duxford, a former RAF station, now a vast air museum. On this particular occasion, it was a summer evening and dusk was setting in. I was in charge of a camouflage exercise that involved the cadets using camouflage to hide and me trying to spot them. I was walking past several World War II era buildings when I saw two figures in the distance walking towards me. As I got closer, I saw that the two figures were US Air Force officers. Not an uncommon sight, we're not far from RAF Lake and Heath, a USAF base, maybe they're visiting. As I got closer, I realized they were wearing outdated uniform, and had flying equipment that was extremely old with them. Still not thinking much of it, I saluted them as I walked past, as is customary. They didn't acknowledge the salute, nor say anything. 
I walked off feeling a little uneasy. Later that night, as the exercise wrapped up, I remembered the incident and asked my commanding officer who the two officers were. I got a very odd look and corporal, we haven't had any visitors tonight. Concerned somebody may have broken in, security made a site-wide search, but couldn't find anything. They then quizzed me, and when I described the airmen I had seen, a grim look came over their faces. They proceeded to let me know this wasn't the first time they'd been seen. Back in 1944, a B-17 flying fortress visited the airfield and took some personnel on a joyride. The aircraft collided with a navigation mast at low altitude, and smashed into an accommodation building, exploding on impact and killing all aboard, plus one man in the barracks block. The building was located right next to where I had been walking. Furthermore, the men I described, they were the pilot and the navigator. They've been seen a few times over the years, often by security making patrols at night. I've always felt like I'm being watched when passing that spot. I was born and grew up in a town called Shrewsbury, in Shropshire, England. The town has a reputation of being one of the most haunted places in the world. The town is well over 1,000 years old, a lot of the ruins of old buildings remain, even in the town center. Everyone I know growing up had some sort of experience haunted or otherwise at some point in their lives. So, getting to my most haunted experience that spans a number of years, these aren't my only experiences, but this is the one that has affected me the most. My grandparents have a house that all of the family, my mother and her siblings, grew up in. This house has a back bedroom that gives off a vibe that you just don't want to mess with, it's the only room in the house that has the door always closed and is now used as a storeroom that my nan refuses to enter alone. It was used when I was a kid as spare bedroom for when me and my brother would stay over, but we hated being at that room. One night, me and my brother were asleep in there and I woke up just in time to look over and see the lighting fixture on the ceiling next to my head. I can even remember the feeling of the cold plaster touching my cheek right before whatever the heck was lifting me let go. I hit the mattress and immediately started screaming, and my dad burst into the room to find out what happened. I told him everything, but he was obviously skeptical, but I even remember him saying that the room was very cold even though the heating was on, and there there was an odd feeling he couldn't explain. My brother who was asleep during my incident said he had a dream that night of an old man standing over him shouting for him to get out and to this day, he is reluctant to talk about it because of how real it felt. Now, this is where it starts to get worse. I was told this was over a month after the first incident, but I was at home, in my house, the other side of the town and it happened again. Me and my brother at this time used bunk beds and I slept on the top bunk. My dad was downstairs watching TV, and all of a sudden, he said he got a feeling something was wrong then realized the feeling he felt was the same as it was when I had the incident at my nan's. He ran upstairs burst into the room just in time to catch me falling from the ceiling. I had been picked up, lifted over the bed safety rail, and was hanging with my head tilted towards the ground, and my dad burst in to see me hanging there in mid-air for a split second before dropping and he caught me. He was terrified and could never explain what happened. Nothing ever happened again, until I was in my mid-twenties. My nan was heading out somewhere for an overnight stay, so I said I would stay the night, feed the dogs and sleep on the sofa. I did everything stated, went to sleep on the sofa, but woke up in the morning in the spare room, at the back of the room behind a load of storage boxes. It took me five minutes of moving the boxes out of my way to reach the door to get out. And to this day, now 14 years later, I've no idea how the hell I got in that room over those boxes and to the back section of the room without damaging anything. I've never been more frightened after waking up in all my life and I've never stayed another night in that house since. My nan refuses to talk about that room, my granddad was the same prior to his death. I've no idea what happened in that house, what spirit or worse is living in that back room, but I'll never go back in that room for as long as I live. My mother and I had this start up when I was 16. At this time, we'd never heard of a mimic. We both suddenly started hearing each other calling, often several times a day, usually me upstairs and her downstairs. And on a handful of occasions, I peered over the banister just as she stepped into the hall downstairs as we'd both heard each other at the same time. After a couple of months, it stopped just as quick as it had started. My father seemed to be immune as he never heard us and we never heard him. 
I do recall over the years this had happened sporadically, but we both always assumed we were just imagining it, but this event forced us to acknowledge something odd was going on. Also around this time, I used to see my mum walk past the gap in my bedroom door as I sat at my computer. A few times I followed her into her bedroom to talk to her only to find myself talking to an empty bedroom. Always shrugged those occurrences off as I assumed I was seeing things and never made a connection between the two things until years later. A few months before this all kicked off, I got home from school one afternoon to an unusually empty house, parents were shopping. And shortly after getting in, I heard my rather annoyed brother shout real loud mum from the bottom of the stairs. Having ascertained he wasn't in the house, I then heard him shout for her again. This time he sounded pissed, and I can vouch for the fear I felt at that tone of voice. The biggest problem with this is not only had my brother moved out a number of years prior, but at this particular time, he was at work at least 50 miles away. Add in the fact at this point, I was still brainwashed by my parents telling me there was no such thing as ghosts or the paranormal, so I was in quite a state. I don't know if this was the right thing to do, but I walked to the bottom of the stairs, well close enough for my liking, and with a croaky voice managed to say out loud, she's not here at the moment, but she'll be back soon. Never heard it again, so it was either a coincidence or it listened and went away. All across the country, there are local short tracks like the ovals you see in NASCAR where people can race several different kinds of cars every week. I've always loved NASCAR and my goal is to race at Daytona one day. And ever since I was 11, I've been racing at a local race track in Florida and sometimes at other short tracks around the state when there are big races going on. Right now, I race what are known as super late models, which is the closest you can get to an actual NASCAR race car. Over the years, I've gotten to be a pretty good driver, usually winning multiple times per year. This is gonna sound off topic, but until September of last year, I never believed in the supernatural. But then something very unusual happened that made me reconsider my future as a racer. It was a beautiful Saturday night, and I was getting ready for a big 200 lap race that over 30 other drivers were gonna be in. I was gonna start in third place, but about half an hour before the race, something in my gut told me not to get in the car. But when you're a race car driver, you get used to being nervous and just have to suck it up and deal with it. This time was different though. I had this nagging feeling that something terrible was gonna happen if I got into the car. Even though I couldn't shake the feeling, I still got into my car, and by the time the green flag waved and the race started, I had kind of forgotten about it. About 10 laps in, two cars spun behind me and hit the inside wall. The caution flag flew, signaling for all the drivers to slow down and follow the pace car as the wreck was cleaned up. Now, the feeling came back. This time, however, it made me feel physically sick, and I couldn't race feeling the way I did. So I went through the opening in the turn one wall that led to the parking lot, where all of the race teams worked on their cars. I threw up as soon as I undid my belts and climbed out of my car, and me and my crew packed up and headed home. My friend Pete drove me home as I laid back in the passenger seat, trying to get some rest. The next thing I knew, I was hovering over the racetrack, watching as the cars battled for position, inches apart, trying to make as much ground as they could. As I looked down on the track, one of the cars caught my eye, a familiar white and red car running in ninth place, with a black number 62 on the sides of the car and on the roof. It was my car. I remember being confused, and flying down to the ground to get a better view, and I landed in the infield in turn 1, watching myself racing to stay in the top 10. About 5 laps went by before the unthinkable happened. My car, that was being driven by me, launched off the side of another car as me and the driver next to me battled for position. I watched as my car slid into the opening in the turn 1 wall at over 100 miles per hour, hitting driver's side first. The hit was so hard that it ripped my car in half and tore everything below my hips off. The back half of the car, with me still in my seat, slid back down onto the track as I listened to myself screaming in agony. The other driver swerved trying to avoid the two pieces of my car, but one driver hit me head on, ripping even more off the part of the car I was in and putting me out of my misery. I watched as my head, ribs, lungs, guts, and other organs and pieces of my bones and my skin went flying all over the track, some into the stands where people were watching. A few drivers spun in puddles of my blood as they went by. 
This description doesn't do justice to what I saw. I looked at the terrible scene for a few seconds, then everything went black. I opened my eyes to find myself in the reclined passenger's seat of Pete's pickup truck, where I fell asleep trying to make myself feel better. Luckily I did, and I woke up just as we got back to my house. I thanked him and headed in. As horrifying as it was, at the time, I wasn't gonna let it bother me. Race car drivers sometimes think about fatal crashes as a possibility, but we accept the danger. You have to accept it whenever you do anything dangerous. The next day, I woke up at around 9.30, and after I had breakfast, brushed my teeth, and did everything else you'd expect someone to do in the morning, I went out to my garage, where I kept the race car. I was about to get to work prepping it for next week's race when I noticed something that made me wet my pants, and I'm not embarrassed to admit that. There was a massive dent in the driver's side of the car, right about where I hit the wall in that dream, that freaking dream. I looked inside the car, where I saw that there was a huge crack going down the roll cage. In that moment, I wondered if I should ever race again. Like I said before, I have never believed in ghosts, spirits, or anything paranormal or supernatural. But after I had that terrible dream and saw my car the next day, I started to wonder about a lot of things. Why did I feel a really strong urge not to race that night? Why did I get sick when I tried to? How did my mind paint such a vivid messed up image in that dream? And lastly, what if that wasn't a dream? What if I really did die in an alternate universe and that dream was a glimpse into it? If I hadn't gotten sick in my car that night, would I have lived to race another day? Would everyone that was there be forever traumatized by the sight of my dismembered body flying everywhere? If it was just a bad dream, why did my car have damage in the same place I wrecked it in the dream, even though I didn't wreck in real life? I'm a believer now. Something was at work that night that I think kept me alive, and somehow I feel like I would have died a terrible death if it wasn't. I feel lucky to still be racing today, but it's terrifying to think about things like this. About two weeks ago, I smelled a dead smell on my terrace. Smelled it for two days. It was very strong, I told my mother and sister to check if they could smell it too, and they said they didn't, that they didn't feel any aroma. Two days later, a young woman, late twenties, who lived approximately three minutes away from my house, committed suicide by hanging herself. The suicide happened after the smell. This smell thing happened again four days ago, the same thing happened, the same aroma, no difference between both experiences. Just this time, the smell lasted one day instead of two. My mom didn't smell anything, again. Yesterday a 27-year-old woman suffered a heart attack, after drinking antidepressants. She lived one to two minutes from my house. 